Hi everyone and welcome to a new Digital Foundry Direct. This one's slightly different from the usual. We're going to be taking a look at how we're preparing for the next gen consoles, PlayStation 5, Xbox Series X. There are a huge amount of challenges there to our standard workflow and we've got to work through them, come up with more workable solutions. And it all begins with reassessing the way that we do performance analysis. So back in November 2015, I put together a video showing our console analysis tools and how they work. And well, the principles are really straightforward. You take a lossless feed from the HDMI ports of each console, capture it, and then you run that video capture into our performance analysis tool. And this ascertains by comparing the data from one frame to the next, uh, what the frame rate actually is. And then you get this kind of visualization and then you can double check the results for accuracy before rendering out the graphs into a bespoke video that slots into Adobe Premiere Pro or any video editing tool for that matter. All good stuff then, but here's the thing. We devised FPS GUI way back in 2008 for the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 generation of consoles. They operated uh, typically with a 720p output. That's about 921,000 pixels per frame. Now, that's quite a lot of data to be sifting through. And then when we moved on to PlayStation 4 and Xbox One, that actually increased by a factor of 2.25x, 1080p, over 2 million pixels per frame. This obviously didn't really help matters for poor old FPS GUI, but processors were faster, uh, SSDs came along, so you know we could keep up there. With the arrival of the enhanced consoles and uh, obviously the upcoming debut of PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X, now we were looking at 8 million pixels per frame that needed to be analysed. That's a tall order, of course, but it also meant that the files that we were capturing, well, we just couldn't really do it. What we ended up doing was using this device, an Atomos Ninja Inferno, to take lossy captures at 4K resolution. Then we'd root out the output to our capture cards. It would be downscaled to 1080p, and then we'd be sort of working from a 1080p feed there. Yes, it worked, but the problem is that, you know, we've actually increased the burden here. The file sizes are still huge and we've got two of them this time. We needed to evolve. We needed a much better solution and I think we've got that. So a bit of a live demo here. Let's move over to my desktop and take a look what's going on there. Uh, at the moment, well not much. Um, yes, so I'm going to be resizing the desktop to 1080p first of all so uh, you can get a decent view of what's going on in the video here. And uh, well, yes, let's use NVIDIA Share to capture the desktop. So we're not just filming it, we've got a much better quality direct feed. So where are we going to begin? Well, let's take a look at um, our capture tool first of all. Virtual Dub is a freeware open source capture tool. It's been around for years. It's pretty awesome. It's like the Swiss army knife of video capture and uh, uh, basic video editing and filtering. This is the capture module here. We've actually customized it significantly. So what's going on here? You'll see on the right there, FPS detect. Now, this is pretty awesome. So let's just get on with it. Let's start a capture. Now this is Wolfenstein, the new Colossus, Xbox One X. If we dip into the options, you'll see that uh, we've got dynamic resolution turned off. And when that happens, uh, the new Colossus is actually rendering at native 4K, 3840 by 2160. We're actually capturing all of those pixels. You can see that uh, our average data rate there seems to be about 160, 170 megabytes per second. All good, but the star of the show there, FPS Detect, is actually measuring the frame rate of the game as we play it, as we capture it. And it means that we no longer need to use lossless video captures as we did in the past, uh, because essentially the uncompressed data is analyzed on the fly. Pretty awesome stuff, right? And you can see here that, um, well, the new Colossus it can't render 4K at 60 frames per second consistently at all. I mean, we're down to like 42 frames per second. If we actually jump into the water here, uh, it should go under. Actually, it's not. There we go. There we go, 39. So yeah, we've got a pretty wide frame rate uh, delta there and we're capturing it all in real time. We can see how the game performs as we're actually playing it, which is, well, what can I say? 
pretty awesome. So where do we go from here? Um, well, obviously the reason I've chosen this game is because it doesn't just render at native 4K. There are dynamic resolution scaling options. It lowers the pixel count, and in exchange for that, you get a higher frame rate. It does it all in real time, and this is all pretty awesome stuff. So let's dip into the options here and switch on dynamic resolution scaling. Now, going back to gameplay, you can see FPS detect much closer to the target 60 frames per second there. It's not quite a lot 60, but uh, well, it's pretty close to it. But there's another mode here. I mean, well, we're down to 51 frames per second here. That's obviously not quite where we would want it to be. But remember that back in the day, machine games and id software actually went back and added in an aggressive dynamic resolution scaler. So it kind of increased the range of available resolutions it has to choose from. And this gives you much closer to a locked 60 frames per second in all scenarios here. So that's pretty good. Minor, very minor dips here. And I think if we actually go into some combat, uh, you might get some more variances from the target 60 frames per second there. But the bottom line is that, uh, well, what can I say? Um, the star of the show here uh, for this purposes of this video demonstration is to show that we can actually measure performance before we capture the video and we can display it as we play. So we get much more of a view on how well the game is performing during the analysis phase. And that's pretty awesome. Now, uh, one thing I do want to kind of demonstrate here, one thing that I really like about uh, the, the new Colossus here, if we turn off dynamic resolution scaling, go back to 4K, yes, we've got a massive drop to frame rate there, uh, which isn't great. But I consider this to be a kind of forward compatibility mode. Xbox Series X is going to be running uh, backwards compatibility. This game will run on Xbox Series X and in theory we should have access to much higher levels of GPU power. So I would expect this to be a lot 60 frames per second. I would hope it is. And uh, you can see that it is possible to get this on the X in the here and now, but the scene has to be really simple. So if we look to the sky, 60 frames per second because, well, it doesn't really need to render anything. As we pan down, you can see that we're going back down to lower frame rates there. OK, so we've got our capture, we've got our frame rate data, which is all good stuff. Let's actually take a look at what we've got. So this is my capture drive here and you can see that we've got, well, there's the capture itself, 41 gigabytes. And we've got these text files here, which are actually the performance profiles of every single frame that we captured. I mean, look, that's pretty huge. Uh, 17,563 frames. If we look at the capture itself in media info, we're using a high quality intermediate lossy codec called Cineform. It means that our files are much smaller than they were in the past. And uh, also means that we can capture at full 4K on a single SSD, which is pretty awesome. So what are we gonna do with these files? Let's go into Adobe Premiere Pro here, and I'm gonna import that file. First of all, I'm going to add a platform label. You know that we do that. It just labels that we're using Xbox One X here. And I'm also gonna add a second label, which is gonna be relevant to the graphs that we're gonna be overlaying, which is, well, it just says, you know, as you can see, the frame rate and the frame time. But here's the magic. We're going to add in a new filter that we've developed for Adobe Premiere Pro, FPS Detect Graph. This slots onto the footage like so. Now we're going to open up the properties of the filter. And first of all, we're going to add in a, a graph template. So let's go into our graph template repository there. Um, Xbox One X, 4K, 20 to 60 frames per second. That'll do the job. And we're going to import the performance data. So let's go to the capture. There's the uh, performance data as text files, which I just showed you. Going to be using uh, 2.0 here. 1.0, 2.0. We actually have different versions of FPS GUI that we've developed over the ages. Sometimes it's useful to have access to both, but the uh, filter only uses 2.0. So let's import that. OK. And here we are. This is um, basically real-time 
graphing for everything that we just captured from Wolfenstein the New Colossus. So yeah, we were looking at mid 40s frame rates there and that's exactly what you're seeing visualized here, frame time visualizations as well, all good stuff. If we pop to the end of the video there, you can see that point where I was looking at the sky, getting that full 60 frames per second. There it is. So essentially now we have an asset here that we can use immediately within our edits for the content that we produce. No longer do we need to wait ages, and it really it could be hours sometimes, for FPS GUI exports. Everything is immediately available. But this is exciting for a number of reasons. First of all, we get to see how the game performs as we're capturing it, which is really useful in terms of getting an early heads up of how the game might be performing. And then we have the ability to capture uh, lossy video files. They, I mean, the quality is still absolutely superb with that Cineform codec, but the point is that we no longer need to be using mathematically lossless compression there, which produce these huge files that basically ruled out using 4K through a capture card. We had to use that Atomos Ninja Inferno. Now everything can go through the capture card. And the final improvement, which I think is really profound, is that everything that we capture is analyzed. Now, back in the day with FPS GUI, we would have to uh, either spend hours waiting for the full fat files to import, or we'd clip out the bits that we thought were relevant. But now we have access to everything off the bat. We have improved quality and quantity of data. Now, good example of this. John has done a few videos where he's actually used fast forwards to show performance over time. So rather than just showing clips playing out in real time, we can accelerate the footage to give you an idea of overall consistency. And uh, yeah, Alien Isolation, a good example of that. Uh, behind the scenes, the tourist on the Switch this is a 60 frames per second game. He actually captured three hours worth of stuff there. And throughout that entire duration, there was just three dropped frames. And that's pretty impressive. So yeah, this is what I mean by having quality and quantity of data. This is really impressive, really important stuff for us. Okay, so this concept of actually uh, capturing performance data as we play the games, this also has profound ramifications for what we do with PC too. Now, again, I produced a video, I think it was January 2016, which showed how we use FCAP to accurately gauge PC performance. So what's the score there? Well, essentially we turn VSync off. This allows our frame rates to go well north of 60 frames per second, depending on the hardware. And each frame is given a colored border, which we can track in software. I consider FCAT to be the gold standard in PC performance analysis. I mean, we're literally seeing what's coming out of the video card there. That's hugely significant. That's the final word in performance as far as I'm concerned. So let's take a look at a PC game and see what we can do there. So we're looking at Metro Exodus here, and uh, this is running on a 2080 Ti. I'm going to pop into the options here and uh, well, let's take a look at what we've got there. Okay. 1440p resolution and uh, VSync is off. You can see the FCAP border on the uh, on the left there. And uh, I'm actually going to turn on the performance analysis tool now. And you can see here that just running this menu is uh, producing a frame rate of 170 frames per second. Uh, I'm going to turn on the ray tracing because why not? I think I'll do it on uh, high, which is uh, the best bang for the buck in my opinion. No DLSS. Tessellation, yes, we'll keep that. Native resolution, we'll keep that. So we're good to go. With the raid facing on, that 170 frames per second is at 105. I'd still say that's pretty good for 1440p, but it is just a menu. So let's go into the chapters here. And uh, we're going to go to, I think, this level here, which is quite performance intensive. And well, we're just going to be waiting for the loading now, I guess, but it won't take too long. We're running this from an NVMe drive. System here is actually Cascade Lake 18 cores, uh, which I've been trying to find the time to review, um, but it's been really challenging. What can I say? Sorry about that. It's coming. OK, so now we're moving into gameplay and here we are. The game kicks off with a scripted cutscene of sorts at the beginning. There is an interactivity element to it. You can see that I can move about and whatnot. And obviously the mouse, I have all full access there. And you can see here that uh, FPS Detect is accurately tracking the borders there. And it is producing a viable frame rate without having to use Reva Tuna's own uh, internal uh, frame rate tool, which is pretty good. So, I mean, 
I think we've got enough here to prove the point. There are actually some occasional stutters happening here. Uh, I'm not quite sure why that's happening, but we can take a look at that shortly. OK, so I'm going to stop the capture and we're going to pop into Adobe Premiere and we're going to see how FCAT is looking there on the timeline. OK, so as you can see, there's our Wolfenstein capture from Xbox One X and there's our Metro FCAT capture. Uh, obviously, we need to add the frame rate grid that we were talking about earlier. Um, and again, I've got a nice uh, text overlay for the elements that we're going to need there. I'm going to add the grid filter and I'm going to import what we need there in terms of the template, the graph template. And I'm going to import the performance data that we captured in real time there. And there we go. OK, so moving into gameplay here, you can see that the grid is actually not wide enough to encompass the uh, performance data. That's not really a problem. Ideally, you'd pop back into FPS GUI and then create a new graph template which you'd import into Premiere. But we do have some overrides here which definitely help. See those stutters that I was talking about earlier? This does tend to happen in a lot of PC games. Uh, I don't know whether it's like shader compilation or uh, streaming issues uh, at the beginning of levels usually can play havoc with benchmarks so you have to be quite careful about that but the point is you can see everything there you can see that bit where we're looking at the sky where we got that big spike to frame rate and this is all pretty impressive stuff but anyway that's all i've got for you today i hope you found this look inside digital foundry to see how we're preparing for xbox series x and playstation 5 there's a lot of work we're doing behind the scenes a lot of questions we're asking about how best to assess the experience that these new games are going to be offering and in a sense the arrival of the enhanced consoles has given us a big leg up there but as always, please do like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Ring the bell for instant notifications whenever we post a new video. And yes, of course, I keep talking about it, but it's of extreme importance to the team. The Digital Foundry Patreon, a small contribution, and you get access to pristine quality video downloads, and you get a warm and fuzzy feeling of knowing that you're helping to make Digital Foundry financially viable. But that's all from me for now. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of this one, if indeed you did. And just generally, thanks for watching and supporting Digital Foundry.